Coming up this time on Art Rocks, some Shreveport-based fabric magic from a woman who spins quite the yarn, if you'll pardon the pun. So I learned how to weave. Iconic figures whittled out of wood, using art to build a bridge between generations. And a young artist looks at the stars for inspiration. That's all about to happen on Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello and thank you for joining us for Art Rocks with me, James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine. We've been up north today, but not too far north in Shreveport to meet a woman whose talent for working wool has to be seen and felt to be believed. Forget the simple sweater, have a look at these amazing things. From a very young age, I was always involved in some type of material or a fiber my mother sewed and thought it would be a good idea for me to learn. In the 70s, I got involved with the Expansion Arts Program in Florida, so I learned how to weave. So I have a couple of looms. I learned how to spin. I mainly work in wool, silk, sometimes bamboo fibers. Sometimes I get the fleece that is that I have to take and wash and card and dye. So it's all sustainable materials. Nothing has to dye. Recently I was in a workshop in Austin by a woman from the Netherlands and she taught a class on making coats and it's I made a coat and it's just it's all one piece. You have to make it so large, five times as big as the coat, because wool shrinks. And then we laid the fiber on there and we had to add different pieces so we get the fullness. And then we have the sleeves, no glue, <laughs> no sewing. It's all manipulated. Wool has scales in it and when it's warmed up and there's friction, the scales open and then they connect to each other. So the scarves with the silk, I have a silk base, which I dye all my silk, and then I lay the wool on the silk. Now I have to use cold water because I don't want the wool to felt before it goes through the silk. There's no sewing on these. It's a piece of silk and it's wool. By slowly massaging the fibers, they go through the silk and connect on the other side and it becomes one continuous piece of fabric. On my eco-printed pieces, I use natural dye. There's a bug, it's called cochineal, that grows on cactus that I use a lot. I can get a bright fuchsia with that. So these were eco-printed yesterday. I cook it for three to four hours. Actually, I steam these in an electric turkey roaster. I love that. I just discovered that. Then you take it out and you let it sit overnight before you undo it. And it's really hard to not undo it because you really want to see what you have. And I haven't unrolled them yet. I did two scarves together on this one. And so this is basically what you do. Oh God, that's gorgeous. To take these apart, the bottom one had already been dyed with cochineal, the bug that grows on cactus. And then, oh God, that's gorgeous. See, I never know what's gonna happen. This is eucalyptus right here. And this is sycamore. This is more eucalyptus. Didn't do too much there. But this one is really... There's an oak leaf. 
came out gorgeous. I'm experimenting with doing a lot of pods. It's kind of like magic because you put the fibers down and then you wet them with warm soapy water and then you wrap them in a pool noodle and you use bubble wrap and then you roll. It's labor intensive, but you get a good workout. When it starts coming together, it takes a form of its own. You have to sculpt it because wool has a memory. I have an idea, I have a sketchbook, so I try and sketch everything out before I do it. It doesn't always come out like my sketch, but it is close. And then I will put towels and fabric in them while they're wet so that they'll dry in the shape I want them. The pods are like a cocoon. They're like a safe space. And that's what they remind me of. I'm making lighting fixtures. I have a cage that I get and then the insides go in it and then I felt around it. Those are fun to make. Bags. Wool is so durable, they last forever. Hats. I do hats. I love making hats. And I'm doing some jewelry, some necklaces. And I have cuffs that I make. I've been working on acoustical pieces, like this piece behind me. This is a layered felt. It took me about six weeks to make that thing, but it absorbs sound. This piece is called Among the Fronds. First I did a whole layer of just wool on the bottom, and then I made pre-felt, which is very loosely together, but it holds together, and I cut leaves out, and then I put tape in between. I would put one edge on the background and then put a piece of tape so that it, the whole thing wouldn't fuse together. The vases I make using a resist, it's called a resist, and it's floor underlayment. You know, if you're putting down pergo or something, there's that white base that you put down before you put it on there. Well, I use that for my resist. So you cut a shape out, everything starts out flat and you put fiber on one side, then you flip it, put fiber on the other side, and you do that, you usually do four or five layers so that you can get a really nice thick felt. And then you cut a hole, and you pull your resist out, and then you start to get your shape. This is a cat cave. It's the first one I've made, but they seem to be really popular in Europe. This was all white. I used white wool, and then I eco-printed this. This whole thing was flat, and it had a round resist inside. Then I cut a hole, pulled the resist out, and then I fold it. That's where you, when you fold it, that's where you get it to where it's at a stiff, stiff stage. This is five layers of wool on here. But then this is eucalyptus here, and then I have some roses in here, rose petals, and rose leaves, which give a nice green. And the whole thing was eco-printed. Want to get out of the house and get to grips with some serious art this weekend? Here are some of our picks for notable exhibits coming soon to a museum or a gallery near you. For more about these and many more events in the arts, subscribe to Arts Monthly, the new free e-newsletter from the editors at LPB and Country Roads magazine. What's more, the Art Rocks website features every episode of this program, so to see or share any episode again, log on to lpb.org and navigate to Art Rocks. 
What are Luciano Pavarotti, Abe Lincoln and Babe Ruth share in common? They've all been under the knife of figurative folk artist John Cross. This Elizaville, New York sculptor whittles wood blocks and creates art that fairly glows with humanity. Come along to Cross's studio to learn more. For some reason, and it's not clear, I, I don't know if it is for any artist, I wanted to be an artist. I, 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 I had a, a gift, I think. I learned to carve. I remember as a boy, I was really little. We lived in uh, Jersey, and there was an old grandfather lived next door to me. And he carved little pigs for uh, his kids, I guess, for his grandchildren. And I thought that was so wonderful. He was able to carve these things, give them away, uh, and he just knocked them off. I mean, he'd do tons of them. And I thought, well, what a nice thing that would be to do. And then, so I, I, I think that's what first attracted me. I started doing sort of primitive figures. Somehow, somebody saw those. The guy said, gee, I'd like to show your work. Do you want to show it? I said, well, I, I don't know anything about, I mean, I knew artists showed. This guy sold out the show. And I said, well, that's pretty good. I knew I wasn't going to get out of advertising right away, but uh, it, it was great. The stuff I do tends to have a little sense of period to it. I liked the older time. I think we all do. It was kind of wonderful. And I liked sports. I liked baseball, so I, I carved the giant Dodger game uh, in 51. I buy white pine from the south and it's a very nice wood to carve. It's soft uh, and it has a lovely smell to it. When you hold it in your hand, you can smell uh, the pininess of it. And then I will saw it up into the lengths. Say, okay, I'm gonna do a figure this tall. I like to work from the head down uh, because what can happen if you don't, if you start off with a body and then you end up and you haven't got room enough for a good sized head. If you've ever been to the circus, there'd be the big parade. This is basically my version of that parade with the, the elephant and the baby and the man who picks up what the elephants leave behind. I did this for my grandson, his name is Will. The Will Cross Traveling Circus, greatest show on earth. Absolute came to me and said what I'd do one of their ads. They used to feature artists, Warhol. It'd be Absolute Warhol, Absolute this, Absolute that. And I, so I, I said, sure, I'd love to. And they paid for it, and I was happy to do it. And they said, well, what would you do for us? 
And I said, well, how about guys sitting on chairs, stacked absolute boxes, playing checkers? Because that meant I'd just have to slice off a stick or a doweling. They said, well, we like that, but the head of Mr. Rue, who's the head of absolute, is a chess player. And could you carve a chess game? So obviously carving chess game is different than carving a checker game. So, but I did a chess game and it was kind of fun. I carved a lot of guys. And I said, well, wait a minute, I gotta start carving girls. I mean, nice thing to carve because it was an action figure. They were moving and swan diving. Carving, wood carving, whittling if you would, is a nostalgic activity. I can spend days doing it. There's about a 60-year age difference between the ages of Lorraine Fink and Heather Bryant, yet their art reveals a common thread and their whimsical personalities too. Come to Norfolk, Virginia to see what binds these two artists together. I think the contrast of materials is interesting because you have obviously it's very dense um, natural fabric. Lorraine Fink and I were given this opportunity to do a show at the Slover. At first I was really nervous. It was a short amount of time so we had to really pull our strength together to make it happen. We both got our signature looks, and they do complement each other, and I think it will be a nice pairing for a show. Entering her house, it really was like she had a village inside. In her living room, dining room, all the different um, rooms in her house were filled with these people and they had a strong presence. From early on, I was interested in peoples that are different from ours and especially uh, very primitive people. I just had fun turning them into humanistic looking tribes and totems. All the things from the um, electrician. He was saving stuff for me and had a bunch of stuff in the back of his car. Well, it's fun to see how you're recycling these different items and taking things. You're giving them a new life. There you go. Well, I'm sort of fascinated by each of these having their own personality and they become a part of the people that you collected the objects from. Yeah. So it's sort of like they're yeah. the spiritual being. Mm -hmm. The first works that I was familiar with from Lorraine were her 2D works and the first works that she saw in mine were 2D. So coming together on this project was the first time that we got to see the things that we were doing in the 3D world. So these are some of the things that I've been working on. I start, all of them are started with watercolor mm -hmm. and working into them with ink mm -hmm. and then putting different mediums on them. They have a lot of texture to them, which 
is very similar to your work. And then finding faces and things. I can identify with your aesthetic of looking at these forms and then these beings emerging from them. She put one on top of the other. I said, oh, you made a watercolor, you know, totem, which was a nice give and take with her. Oh, cool. <laughs> This so, is a great piece. Mm -hmm. This is a shaman. He has powers. <laughs> I've known her a long time. I remember I'd seen her work. We were very often on the same wavelength. For the show, we're going to combine her current work, my current work, and three pieces that we're collaborating on. We could maybe paint on these, or even add some crocheted elements to it. I think that would be fun. Mm -hmm. It was the bulbs from the lighting fixtures that I had painted black and white, and they were animals and birds, like and Heather enhanced it. Foundation, and we can add bits of color to it. We can build off of this pink and kind of have it emerge. Mm-hmm. Would you want to paint into mine, and I'll yeah. crochet into yours? <laughs> we could <laughs> that do that. That would work, too. Uh -huh. We both got our signature looks, and I could see her hand here and my hand there. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. That'll be fun. Mm -hmm. I started undergraduate when I was like 60. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> the kids are five kids already going off to college. <laughs> when I found out that Lorraine didn't get started in her artistic practice to much later in her life until she was in her 60s. I was really surprised about that just because of the, um, the expanse of her work. To me, it struck me as somebody who had always been working at that capacity. So Lorraine, you'll be um, showing your totems. Yeah. It'll be really cool to see them at the Slover. Yeah. They're going on yeah. an adventure. It's a beautiful new world-class building uh, and what a beautiful space to show my tribes and totems that they just felt like they moved in. I was really impressed by the different components, whether it was the found bits and pieces, uh, seeing all those materials together was really impressive. I wasn't sure how everything was going to come together, but I felt like it was a huge success between the people who came to celebrate Lorraine, the people who came to celebrate me. We had very different groups there, and seeing those different groups interact and the questions that they asked us both was really positive. Even though our works are different, there's a lot of common themes, so it was really cool to investigate. She definitely transforms objects and makes you think about them in an entirely different way. You saw this thing like staring at you as you're walking down the hall. But <laughs> good monster or bad monster? <laughs> I think we both enjoyed each other. Every, every inch of it, it's inspired. Hello, well, thank you for coming. It's been a great um, experience working with Lorraine. We've both had a lot of fun. And we've done three collaborative pieces that are up front, so please check it out. And I, Lorraine is a big inspiration to me, and we have so much in common as far as working with images that investigate the spiritual world and looking at the past, present, and future as subject matter. So, um, do you have anything you'd like to say? You just said everything I was going to say. <laughs>
When I'm in my 90s, I hope I'm exactly where Lorraine is. She's still making things, she's still thinking of new ideas, she's still challenging herself and reinventing her artwork. So that's exactly where I'd want to be. For Orlando, Florida high school student Mackenzie Fitzgerald, drawing is more than just a hobby. Her unique creations, inspired by science fiction characters and outer space itself, allow her to express herself. Here's a look. My name is Mackenzie Fitzgerald and I'm a junior at Haggerty High School. I started drawing in fifth grade. I used to draw after I watched like the Saturday morning cartoons, I would draw the characters I try to copy them, then I try to make, make up my own sort of sci-fi characters to go along with the stories. I've always sort of been like fascinated with outer space and I really admire the pictures from the Hubble telescope. I really just love how each picture is different and unique and no, no two clusters of stars are the same. I try to incorporate that into my art and use the colors from those pictures. I just really like using like really bright, vibrant colors in my pieces. I like having one color throughout the whole piece to sort of tie it all together. Mackenzie is an amazing student. She's so easy to teach. She is smart, she's sweet, she's focused, and extremely talented. She can come up with ideas and bring them to fruition. Mackenzie understands the art elements and design principles and how they work together. She can put them together and come to a masterpiece. I hope to maybe one day work for Disney, maybe as a concept artist, just to be able to like bring the ideas of the writers into reality. I've always loved creating my own things and being able to take the ideas from my head and put them on paper. I think it's like taking a snapshot of what you're thinking and being able to like take it from your mind and show someone this is what I this is what I did, this is what I made. It's like you can't express in words, so you express in pictures. Well, that is that for this edition of Art Rocks, but remember, to find or share any episode again, visit lpb.org slash artrocks. And if you want more reasons to explore our great state, Country Roads Magazine makes a great resource for learning what's going on in the arts and culture all across the state. So until next week, I'm James Fox Smith, and thank you for watching.